Hey everyone, and welcome to the show. I am Whitson Gordon. I'm Adam Gotches. And this week, Eric Ravenscraft is joining us via Google Hangouts. What is up, Eric? Hello, folks. How's it going? I'm doing all right. Thank you for asking, Whitson. Most people don't. <laughs> because um, I work from home. All right, we got some good <laughs> stuff to go through today, but first, an announcement. Um, those of you who have been listening to the show or following the site have probably noticed that a few little um, sub-blogs have been popping up around Lifehacker. We talk about them at the end of every show. Um, they include Hackerspace, our reader blog, and Lifehacker After Hours, our not-safe-for-work tips blog. <laughs> and this week, we launched another one. It is called Two Cents, and it is a Lifehacker blog all about personal finance. Um, we talk about a lot of kind of finance tips and tricks on the regular Lifehacker site. But the point of the sub-blog is to kind of go a little bit deeper into that subject, kind of beyond the basics. For those people who are just really interested in personal finance, beyond the, the regular stuff that we post on the site, uh, like the other blogs, it is a separate site. If you want to follow it, you will have to follow its RSS feed or Twitter separately. You can find it on Twitter at 2 cents LH. Um, and we will periodically share some of the bigger stories over to Lifehacker, but if you want to follow them, you will have to follow them separately to try and keep keep all the categories separate for people who are interested in different things as uh, you know we continue expanding. So I highly recommend checking that out. We just launched it a few days ago, and they've already got some good posts up. So oh, and it's headed up by um, a new a new contributor to Lifehacker. Uh, Kristen Wong, who was a writer or is a writer over at Get Rich Slowly and some other finance blogs. So if you're a fan blog. of them, it's basically like yeah. them and Lifehacker had a baby. <laughs> That's how one reader described it. And I'm like, that sounds accurate. Um, all right, cool. Let's right. go into the news. Eric, why don't you no. kick us off with the first kind of bigger story of the week? Steam's family sharing feature is now available to everyone. What is wow. family sharing? Basically, you can... I think you have to be on a network with someone when you start it off, but I can ac I can allow another Steam account to access my entire library of games. They can download them, they can play all of them as much as they want, as long as I am not currently playing one of my games. You've so this is the feature that's kind of controversial about it, because yeah. it's stupid and sucks. <laughs> oh, um, I, I disagree <laughs> with you, sir. Yeah, Eric and I had a big argument about it this week. <laughs> Essentially, the idea is that if, if, you're, if I'm playing any game the person I'm sharing with can't play any game. Yeah. In my oh. opinion, it should be if we just can't play the same game at the same time. I See, agree. I, I understand why you would want that. On the other hand, not only is that a huge amount of access, because, I mean, you would basically... There would never be any restriction, really. But also, I don't really... Like, no one can use my library now anyway. It's a free thing, and you have hundreds of hours in the week to play my entire library. I don't care. But, but unless I'm sharing with someone in, like, India... Which is a good well, use of this. Okay, I, I am going to I, be playing games, you know, after 5 p.m. during the day, same time that the person you, I'm sharing with you probably play games wants to play way games. more often than I do. I mean, that's yeah, but so you and I couldn't <laughs> share a library because I, we both. You can you know, share my library. I play like one or two days a week. <laughs> but what if I want to play one of those days? It's just such a hassle. Well, then it's, it's mine. Like, even it more of a hassle than World of Warcraft's Patch Tuesday was. You know, when you I realize like, oh crap, me. I can't play. I never I, play my library. <laughs> That's true. I you can just Dodges. use it. <laughs> Dot just has like one game in his library. The, the problem I here, it, I understand what you're saying um, in that it would, it, in theory it would just give everyone free access to everything in Steam, but you could say the same thing about the Kindle lending library or about literally any industry before everything became digital. You know, I actually, back when video I games just started CDs, looking into the Kindle lending library, so maybe I would say that. I don't know. But that, that sounds awesome. <laughs> it is. It's And it's... <laughs> You know, anyone. Yeah, I can lend you a book, and then you can read it, and then it comes back to me when you're done. And yes. it was like that way for a long time before <laughs> everything became digital. You know, if you wanted to borrow a CD from me or a game that was on disc or a movie that was on DVD, I would lend it to you. You could watch it, and I could not watch it, but I could still watch watch the rest of the DVDs that I had bought and were sitting in my cabinet, you know? You could actually make the not argument that that was not the case for gaming, because if, I, like, the entire family... This is supposed to be, like, a family in one house. That's why you have to be in the, the same network to set it up anyway, which is the bigger restriction, actually. But if, I, if we had a PlayStation, the whole family could share all of those games, but not if I'm on it. And I think that's what they're trying to emulate there. But what if you just bought a second, a second uh, uh, PS3 or whatever... Then in that case, I mean, if the family has multiple consoles and someone else has, you know, wants to and borrow Steve the game, didn't like if a family has multiple computers, which is what this is for. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, there's there there are slight differences there, and I yeah. I see both sides to it. It's just annoying to me, and I guess that's why it's called I, family sharing and not friend sharing. I think yeah. what this is more useful for is um is sharing just across your own multiple PCs. Like I have a PC in my living room and a PC in here, and I'd like to be able to use my Steam account on both. But if I log in on one, I have to like log out in the other, and it's this kind of weird hassle. Um. So it, I can see that being useful and just making things a little bit easier. But anyway, see we'll see yeah, how it yeah. goes. I haven't used it myself, so yeah. I don't want to crap on it too much. But it's definitely better than nothing. I mean, because yeah, I, I, I could see circumstances where I would use this. Yeah. yeah I didn't absolutely. realize you had to be on the same Wi-Fi network. I, I believe oh, really? so. I th- like, well, that's not when you, not all the time, but when you first set it up, because oh, like, okay. when you, like, I tried to set up uh, it with another account, and it says... Well, where is it? Um, so here we like go. Your... Authorized account. No other local accounts found because no one, no other accounts are logged in mm-hmm. on my network. I see. But, but once you leave the network, you can still share the library, I believe. Okay. I mean, so I think that I think weird. that's fine, but at the same time, I just hate these the, all the effort that gets put into these restrictive copy protection yeah. mechanisms that basically say we know you're going to cheat. And we're going to screw you over in advance, because um, I think I I don't know if that's necessarily what I would do. I'm not saying I wouldn't cheat, but I I know I you know I mean I I just wish there's a little bit more trust, and they I don't like that they're spending money on it. You yeah, know, they're spending money and time developing ways to lock it down more. I prefer the you know. I like DRM like it like on you know a lot of the app stores where it's tied to your email address and that's that. Yeah. You can't really share those apps, so I guess that sucks. But you know. Yeah. I, let's. I hate DRM too, but Steam is fairly open as far as DRM con- is concerned. You know, the Mac App Store has nothing mm-hmm. like this. Steam's yeah. DRM has always yeah. not. You know, it's not Origin <laughs> or, <laughs> or anything like that. You know, at least I can play if I'm offline. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I will say, at the very least, um, there is still the classic workaround if you don't like this. Um, that some commenters pointed out, like if you, if I were to like give you the password to my account, which I don't want to do, but if I trust you, I can do that. You switch to offline mode. You have my whole library all the time. So that's true. There's still, it's not like this is the only way either. So that's a good point. And yeah. you know, there's always just Steam sales too. Yeah, exactly. It's, you know, the money really shouldn't be a factor at this point because you can get games so insanely <laughs> cheaply that it's not even worth like trying to steal the games. I have 98 yeah. games in my library and I'm bored with the ones I do play and then I don't play the others. Yeah. So, uh, I think I have a bunch of games because I bought a bundle once. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I do have more than 4 games. It's possible. All right. Next item of news, this one's just really quick, but I thought it was cool. Google added a new feature to its kind of, um, I don't think this is technically knowledge graph, but just when you search for something and it comes up with a box that's kind of smart and knows what you're asking for, it added restaurant menus. So now if you search for a menu for a restaurant, um, you know, if you search like, what's a restaurant? Umami Burger menu. It'll like show you the menu right at the top of your search results, which is really cool because finding menus online is sometimes such a hassle. I'm, yeah, I think this I'm is so wonderful. happy about this. It's yes. a really nice little feature, and it works with voice control too. So you can say, um, you know, like, what is the menu for this restaurant? And it'll show you. So nice little addition. All right, moving on to top stories. Eric, you did something awesome this week. Let's talk about it. <laughs> I did a bunch of searching, which, by the way, I just want to point out, iTunes is the worst thing to search on. I friggin' hate mm-hmm. that. But you I could have heard... ended that sentence with, iTunes is the worst thing. <laughs> That's true. Uh, so I compared the libraries of Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, and Google Play and iTunes, just for fun, and to find out who has the best, widest streaming library. And of TV unsur- shows. Of TV shows, yes. And unsurprisingly, it's Netflix. <laughs> by a pretty huge majority. Uh, Netflix had around just about half of the TV shows that I surveyed from IMDb's Top 250 or whatever, and Amazon had like half of that, and Hulu had 92 out of 250, but they like most of those were recent episodes. So Netflix is the best for having a huge library of shows, Amazon kind of fills in the gaps a little bit, and Hulu is the one you go to for recent episodes of shows. 
And, and, and that, Amazon's people. probably not worth paying for unless you already have Amazon Prime. Yeah, that's kinda. that's kind of yeah. If you want it just for the video library, it's really not well for TV okay. shows. For TV shows, right. I, sh- I should say, it's not probably movies. not worth it just for that. Um, movies, I guess we'll do later. But th- th- this is really interesting because I feel like at one point in time, Hulu was better. Or they, I, I, you know, they had a better library of shows or something. Yeah, I, well, I like, think it's it, been a little crippled by the networks. Absolutely, yeah. the the fact that you have to wait, you know, whatever it is, a week for an episode to come out, and some shows you can only watch with a cable subscription, and some of the shows yeah. are web only instead of being able to play them on your PlayStation. It's just ridiculous, and it has complete and the sheer amount of commercials make it just not even close to worth it for me anymore. Yeah, this is the yeah. problem with a lot of the. Um, with a lot of the ways the contracts work, and I hate to say this, but I think a cable company is really where this needs to come from, or someone that acts like a cable subscriber, um, but yeah. for the internet. If there's a new business model there, then well, I mean, doesn't doesn't Comcast sort of have a foot in Hulu sort now of. because they're owned by NBC, who's a partner in Hulu? I don't yeah, really know like, how all that works, all, but yeah, this whole thing is incestuous. Yeah, but the Comcast has their own thing where you can watch online too. It, with Wait, Xfinity. what is that called? Oh, Xfinity. Yeah. Well, yeah, okay. if you're a Comcast subscriber. Exactly. So there's there's just all this stuff, but I mean, there there's not. I don't think there's anything wrong with having a however much a month streaming option where you can get TV channels. Like I don't I don't understand why there no one's pushing for that yet. Yeah. Um, get an on-demand library for a lot of money a month probably, but <laughs> I feel like. I've seen companies Easy talk about hinting at doing that, but then they never do, or they're trying to figure out the math or something. I don't know. Like, I would go for that, though. If you said, this is like Hulu or what Hulu wanted to do, only it doesn't suck, even if it didn't suck on the level of, like, Netflix. Netflix has, like, it's a 50-50 shot to find a show there, but I would take that over Hulu with maybe a third of the shows, and most of them are... I just want to point out, I didn't go into detail on this, but the recent episodes thing I have on that graphic, that is a wide category. There are the last five episodes, the last eight episodes, the last month of episodes, like five different types yeah. of categories of a rotating set of shows or episodes. I think the important point here is that Netflix will only will take will give you a larger portion of a show's library, but only up until you know, only up until the point right. uh, where the show's been out on DVD, basically, which is I, you know, kind of how Netflix works. It doesn't give you the current season, which right. for some people is fine. But yeah, um, anyway, you put together a really great graphic with with some of the most popular shows and what services they're available on. It's really, really cool. Um, I highly recommend checking it out. We'll put a link to it in the show notes. Cool. Dodges, think... you talked about poop. Yeah, <laughs> I knew that. I knew this was coming. <laughs> <laughs> Could you uh, feel it? Yeah, I can. Yeah, you knew it was coming because it's in rundown of, of the schedule. schedule. <laughs> yeah, right now. Please, please stop saying rundown while we're talking about this. Yeah. <laughs> well, so we did a we did a post called "What's the color of my pee mean?" a while ago, and and we just thought, why not poop? And the reason why not poop is because then you have to have pictures of poop. But Whitson, you actually solved this problem, and like, why not have cartoon poop? So. We, I, I took a look into, uh, you know, what the shape and color of poop can mean. I uh, learned a few things I didn't know before. And there, there's something called the Bristol stool chart, which allows you to diagnose your poop shape and type. And, you know, type 1 and 2 means you're constipated. 3 and 4 means you have great poop. It looks like a sausage or... I'm really glad. ...is on the way <laughs> to... Right after you said sausage. It was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, uh, three, uh, five to seven is on the way to diarrhea. Seven is actually diarrhea. Um, but you can look. We we posted the chart. If you you know haven't eaten yet, uh, you might want to go check out the article to look that up. But we also talk about color, and color can be indicative of a bunch of problems. It can also mean you ate a beet or a lot of spinach last night, and uh, and that can that can cause color. So there's a lot of like it's kind of like uh, you know reading your future. You're not. It's. It, there's a lot of interpretation that's involved when it comes to interpreting your poop. So you know, it's good to know a few things, but it's also good to consult your doctor if you actually have a concern. And cool. That's it. That's. All. I'm done with. I'm done with poop for this segment of the show. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, and I just wanted to call attention. I didn't write that much this week, but Milani did a post that I really liked called um, Five Communication Mistakes Almost Every Couple Makes." And it was actually really well put together. And it was um, 
it was slightly different than some of the other kind of relationship posts that we've done. And it's funny that everyone who reads this kind of, A, recognizes almost all of them immediately. Like, oh, yeah, I've definitely experienced that before because it's just something that is so common. And almost everyone could pick out one on their list that was, like, their pet problem or, like, I their didn't... partner's Problem. I haven't seen this. What were some Which of the things? one of the problems. Oh, it's great. So it, it, it's it's things like um, assuming that more communication is the solution, or the opposite, <laughs> expecting your partner to read your mind and know what you want at all times, and then getting mad when they don't, you know, follow through on something that you want but didn't say. I um, actually don't do that, but I've been. Everyone I've been with does that. I'm yeah. the I'm the anti mind reader. I like try to tell people that in, in, ahead of time. You like you need to tell me what's going on because I'm not going to assume. <laughs> See, I'm, like I'm the opposite too. of that. Like I always try to figure out what people are thinking. Oh, I and do. That I'm gets just really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, see the. Uh, I don't want to say I'm right more often than not, but I am but right we all more think often we're not. right more often than not, let's be real. <laughs> no, it's fine. I'm stupid, so it's... <laughs> but no, I'm the one bragging. who, like, like, I know something's wrong. We need to talk about it. Like, let's talk about this thing. And then that ends up making people more pissed off than they should be. And my girlfriend actually just got on to me about that this week. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, no, but I like the that first one mostly because... Um, like she talks about like doing other things besides talking about it, and that was the hardest. Le- like now, like if I feel like there's a problem, the first thing I do this is gonna sound cheesy as hell. But the first thing I do is smile and find <laughs> something to justify it. Justify like, the smile? Yes, to justify the smile. Like I'm pissed off about something, or I know you're pissed off about something, so I smile and then like go, like let's go do something fun, or let's interesting, s- or say something sweet or something to get the topic off of there's a problem. Right. One of the most awesome and weirdest tips I ever heard um, was when you're when you're fighting with your significant other, like actually kind of like having a fight, yeah. um, stop and get naked <laughs> because yeah. it's really hard to be super angry when people are naked and the whole <laughs> yeah. thing just goes much smoother. Uh, anyway, I highly recommend reading Milani's post. It isn't about being naked, um, but... <laughs> It's got yeah, some it's got some good tips in there, and it's honestly, you read it, you'll you'll know exactly what they're talking about just by reading each subhead because it's something that we've kind of all been through a lot and probably go through on a regular basis um, with our significant others. So it's good stuff. All right, let's move on to the fun stuff. Questions. Anthony is going to start us off, and he asks, I love my Android phone, but I've noticed that if I go somewhere that doesn't have a data or phone signal, my phone battery will drain really quickly. I know that I can toggle my data uh, off with airplane mode manually, but is there an app or another method that can do this automatically for me? Um, Eric, I want to point this to you because you're the Android expert. I thought of Juice Defender. That is a good option, particularly if you're like... Like, say you're on T-Mobile in Arkansas or some place that doesn't have people in it. Um, <laughs> Every Arkansas listener just started hating you. <laughs> so I actually already have plenty of people in Arkansas who hate me, as is. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're saying there are plenty of people in Arkansas. <laughs> like, in one little section. So my camera just went blurry and I don't know how to... Okay, there we go. Anyway, um... Juice Defender is good because that will, like, it'll cut off whatever communication you want. Like, it'll turn off your wireless data and only turn it back on every few minutes to check in and make sure you got a message. So if you're consistently having problems just everywhere, that's a good option. Another option you can use is Tasker and specifically a plugin called Auto Location, which enables you to use what are called geofences in Tasker. Basically, if there's a problem area that you know of, like every time like I go to this one place... or something. What was that? Like your office or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If you go to your office and you know you get bad signal at your office, you can use this plugin and Tasker to say, every time I'm here, turn off data. Or turn it off for a period of time and come back on only here. I Juice Defender might be able to filter by location, I forget, but if not this works for specific areas. So it kind of depends on what type of, like what your specific problem is, but. Yeah, and if you have Wi-Fi at that specific area, exactly. use Wi-Fi and get the best of both worlds. Um, the other, yeah, it, it's, it's hard if it doesn't, 
I can't tell from his question whether he's having this problem regularly at a specific location or if he's just, you know, in in a rural area and doesn't get very good service m many of the places that he goes. And that's probably a little bit tougher. I don't know of an app that will just turn off your data when you don't have data, you know. Yeah. Um, but hopefully the auto location plug. That's probably the best option. I think. Yeah. You're right. And if it is just you just need it to turn off data when you don't have data. Juice Defender, like, you can do Juice Defender every two minutes and you'll never notice. Yeah. I mean... The other thing is that if you, um, you know, Android has the, the quick settings pull down uh, right. and stuff like that, and if you use something like CyanogenMod, it'll make it even easier to access, or something like Exposed Framework will make it easier to access, um, which means you can turn airplane mode on and off really, really easily with, like, two taps. Yeah, so exactly. In it, when in doubt, or if nothing else works... You can try and make airplane mode more accessible, or maybe put a widget on your home screen or lock screen or something like right. that. The power also, I'm not sure you didn't say what phone he has, but if you're using anything remotely close to stock Android, like CyanogenMod, two swipes down from your status bar to pull down the settings. Oh, that's right. I knew that. I and I totally forgot. Um, it used to be if you pulled down from the right edge, which is yeah. what I have it set to with exposed. Oh, you're okay. right. In newer versions of Android, it's if you pull down with two fingers, you get the. Okay. Awesome. Yep. Thank you for that extra tip. I <laughs> forgot. All right. Dodge's this question is probably for you. Uh -oh. Gavin asks, with a new baby on the way very shortly, I want to make sure to preserve the memories with some nice photos. I currently have a point and shoot and an iPhone 4S, but I'm wondering if it's worth upgrading to a DSLR or mirrorless camera. I'm leaning toward the Sony NEX 3N. There are some good deals on right now, and I don't mind spending the money if it means significantly better photos, but not if it's only marginally better. Okay, so there are a couple of things to talk about here. Um, I would definitely recommend going with Sony in this case, as much as I, like, I'm a big Canon fan, um, and, I, and I like what they do, and I think they make great cameras, and I think Nikon makes great cameras too, and they're all, you know, I guess I could just... You just so you like everybody. I like it. I like everybody for something. Can't you know? It's not worth getting into. But I think Sony offers the most options since you are obviously comfortable with a phone. You like using the phone. You want to put the photos on your phone, but you want better quality. Sony has a nice uh, link up with uh, with the cameras they make now because they all have Wi-Fi, and you can and they all have a, a send a smartphone feature where you can get a Play Memories app on Android or iPhone and just send the send the photos over uh, the Wi-Fi like that. Like, you, your phone connects via Wi-Fi. And in some cases, they have NFC in them, so this is not going to help you because you have an iPhone, but Android phones can just tap onto it, and then it will connect to the Wi-Fi network automatically, so it's a lot faster. But if you're out and about or something, and you just launch the Wi-Fi network on your on your Sony camera, then the, phone, the iPhone will find it pretty quickly, and you don't have to do it manually. So that is a huge advantage if you are talking about getting higher quality, but you want to also use your smartphone for dealing with those photos afterwards. I think you don't necessarily need to go to a DSLR level. Um, Sony's DSLRs are nice. Uh, they, their mirrorless cameras, I think, are really the sweet spot in terms of quality and size. I like that. I use a... Uh, and price. NEX, the end price, yes, thank you. I use an NEX6. Um, and I think that's really great. I think if you're not looking for something really, you know, you don't like, you don't need a ton of manual features. The three or the five are also phenomenal. And and uh, I mean, they whatever the latest variant of that is, because there's like the five N and the three N and so on. Um, and then you can get a couple of lenses that suit you. One other thing to consider, however, is the uh, Sony RX100 uh, or the preferably, I guess, the Sony RX100 Mark II. And that is actually a point-and-shoot camera, but the quality is phenomenal. It is very close to what you'll achieve with, uh, you know, with one of the mirrorless cameras. You don't get to swap out your lenses or anything else like that, but it's, it's a, it's a point-and-shoot. It's small. It's much easier to take with you. It's what I generally use as my camera when I'm going out, and I don't, you know, I'm not satisfied with the phone. So what um what's the price differential between something like that and something like a Sony mirrorless? You'll get a much better deal on a Sony NEX 3N or whatever the case may be these days, um with the whatever the latest one is. Uh, you can probably pick up one of those for about four hundred dollars and then put some money into an extra lens because you're going to want that. The lenses it comes with aren't great. Uh, I'd recommend getting the 35, but that you're gonna look, you're looking at like four hundred bucks there. Although for the most part you're looking at four hundred dollars for a lens for that camera. Um, so if you start getting lenses, 
it you're looking at at you know somewhere but somewhere around seven eight hundred dollars for an NEX camera, which is I think why they're so cheap to buy into because you're buying into a system. Whereas with the RX100, you can pick that up for about five fifty, and the RX100 Mark II I think is at seven fifty right now. But you won't be buying peripherals for that. So is it better than the the NEX with the default lens? I I I. I can't say that technically speaking, but I'm more pleased with the pictures it produces than uh, right. than the than the default lens that the NEX cameras come with. However, if you do want to know what the NEX uh, what the NEX cameras look like, what the lens looks like, just watch this podcast because I'm using the default zoom lens right now, <laughs> um, and I'm on an NEX VG30. So it's not like the quality is bad; it's yeah. nice looking. So. Um, and I and I think the other the other thing here that that I think you touched on, but part of his question is 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 it worth the money to upgrade to one of these cameras versus an iPhone? And I think the answer is absolutely yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I the iPhone likes to think that its camera is great, and it is really great for. It a doesn't smartphone. suck like horribly. It's probably yeah. the best camera you'll find on a phone, save for maybe the Nokia Lumia line. But it's still, I mean, the difference between that and a DSLR or a mirrorless is night and day. Yeah, and I mean, the thing is, what we're talking about is on on a cell phone, and especially on the iPhone, when lighting conditions are great, you're going to get great pictures, and that's why you see all all these amazing photos taken with an iPhone, because people know how to light properly, or they happen to be in good lighting conditions. However, when you don't, you know, when you're not carrying around a lighting kit with you, which probably not with a baby, because it's dangerous... (laughs) You're gonna have um, you're gonna have a much better time with a camera that's meant to handle low light situations. Yeah. DSLRs are obviously better equipped for that because you can get faster lenses with wi- meaning wider apertures are possible. Um, so you can get much higher quality photos that way. So that's the bonus. But also with a camera like the ARX100 or ARX100 Mark II, that camera is specifically designed to handle low light well, and it does a great job. And it has for its entire lifespan has been. The, the point and shoot to buy for basically people who want great photos, want DSLR quality, but don't want this something that big or even something as big as a uh, mirrorless camera. Yeah, um, cool. And I I found a link. Uh, F Stoppers has a pretty good comparison between the iPhone camera and a DSLR um, that'll kind of show you what the difference is. It's just the DSLRs are much more consistent, especially like you said across low light. So I'll put a link yeah. to that in the show notes. It really you. helps to see it. It's yeah, it's absolutely crazy. Um, you, right. you you see it and you'll be convinced. Yeah. All right. Kendra writes. Like most people, I play a f- I pay a flat fee for internet access. I'm on the web all day, but I don't download any movies, so I wonder if my bandwidth usage is lower than my neighbors. More importantly, I'm thinking about moving to a pay-as-you-go internet provider. Something like Freedom Pop and others let you pay by the gigabyte. I don't know if this will be cheaper than my current flat rate because I don't know how much bandwidth I use. Is there any way to determine my current monthly bandwidth usage? Um, there are a few sides to this. One thing that, that you're going to have to kind of worry about with something like Freedom Pop is how good of service you get inside your home. Um, it's not going to be as reliable as something like cable internet. Okay, mine is um, actually really good. But really? there are a lot of places where it's completely non-existent too. So yeah, it really depends on where you're gonna you are. You're going to have to see. Um, and and you know how fast it is too, because the the speed can kind of I think fluctuate a little bit more. I got about six to seven megabits per second. You you sh- you just check the Sprint service area. Okay. Um, so anyway, to to get to your main question, which is how do you find out how much bandwidth you're currently using, the best way is to go to your ISP's website, log into your account, and they'll usually have an area where you can see how much bandwidth you use every month. Um, there are other ways to do it. You can install a program on your computer or monitor it from your router, but going to, your, going to your ISP's website is definitely the best way, and we have a post with more information on that for a bunch of different providers, so I'll put a link to that in the show notes. But it should be really easy to find if you just go to your you know, Comcast or Charter or whoever is your provider, go to their website, log into your account, you'll find it. Okay, let's move on to a few live questions. Um, related to what we were just talking about, Liam has a question about cameras. So not just, I'll shoot this over to you first. I have a mirrorless camera, but I want to use high-range telephoto lenses. Am I better off going with a lens adapter like the Nikon F mount uh, or a full DSLR? Okay, I'm not sure I totally understand what he's asking. The He has a mirrorless camera. He wants to use high-range telephoto lenses. So should he use a lens adapter oh, for his mirrorless wants, camera oh, or get a DSLR? 
Okay. I, w- I wish I knew what the camera was. Um, <laughs> it, because it depends. Like Sony, for example, it sounds like it might be a Nikon one. <laughs> Um, if he's if he's talking about the well, although a lot of people just mount, Nikon's are you know old Nikon lenses and they're they're very easy to they're cheap to get and people mount them on all sorts of things so who knows but if you so one of the advantages of the Sony cameras is Sony has an adapter for Sony DSLR lenses and it has proper autofocus and everything so if you have a if you have one of the Sony mirrorless cameras I feel like I'm an ad for Sony today. But if you have someone, one of the Sony mirrorless cameras, getting an adapter is actually really good, and it's worth sticking with it. Um, and and I, I'm also, you know, not convinced there isn't a good, uh, there isn't a great, te- maybe not great, but good enough telephoto lens for a mirrorless camera. Let's just presume for the case, uh, since he he seems to believe that there isn't, um, that there isn't one uh, for for the camera he's using. Getting a DSLR is like if you really want. Su- I mean, if you want super long range, like I want to take pictures of the moon and the stars, long range, uh, DSLRs are just going to be better. But you're talking about investing a lot of money. Uh, the, I mean, the, the the longer that that zoom range gets, I mean, once you get past 300 millimeters, basically, it is expensive. It's really really expensive, uh, especially if you get a decent one, um, because you can. the The problem is you can get cheap telephotos, but they're really shake. They're really shaky, and it actually doesn't. Stabilization really matters. Um, aperture really matters. Uh, so there's, you don't want to get a cheap telephoto. It and that's a really tough question to answer. I would say get an adapter if you can. If autofocus matters to you, and the adapter can handle autofocus well. Otherwise, you need to look at a DSLR because you're not going to get what you want. Cool. Um, apparently, it's camera day at the Lifehacker show because Evan. <laughs> has a question about cameras, sort of. He says, I received an iPad mini for Christmas, and I'm having a hard time figuring out what role it should play. One thing I would like to try is using it as a way to view photos from my DSLR. Do you have any suggestions on how to do so? Get a camera kit. <laughs> the, well, I mean, because they, they have that iPad camera kit. Hopefully your DSLR uses, um, uh, uses uh, SD and not compact flash, in which case you're kind of screwed there. Um, but if you have a Sony camera, <laughs> oh my God. you can just transfer them over Wi-Fi. Other other cameras do that. They're uh, so it's not it's not just Sony. Didn't we do but, a post on this? Oh yeah, I did a post on this. I was gonna say. <laughs> I'll put it in the show notes. We'll put it in the show notes. Yeah, the yeah there's a um, yeah there there are ways to remotely transfer your photos. But the best thing you can probably do in terms of an iPad and a standard DSLR, if you're using SD, SDHC, SDXC, whatever, um, <laughs> SD cards. <laughs> Of some kind is to just get the camera kit because it's like thirty bucks. You plug it into the bottom, and then it, or, and then you can just import the photos. Yeah, it's pretty cool. All right, we have two questions about processors. Oh, good. Okay. Is one of them Casper's? Yes. No, it's both Sony. Of, both of these, <laughs> both of these are really, really broad questions, and and require not only more information, but probably require that the askers do more research on what they're looking for. Casper says, "What is the best not overclocked processor that you can buy?" Which is an impossible question to answer because sure there are really powerful ones you could buy for thousands and thousands of dollars. <laughs> um, and Daniel asks Intel Core i7 or Xeon. So okay, both okay. of you need to back up for a second and think <laughs> about what you're doing and how much you want to spend because there are way more processors out there than you think. It sounds like, um, and you need to think about what you're using these for. Um, if you're building a gaming computer get an i5 and call it a day. That's all you need. <laughs> like, the i7 is completely unnecessary. Anything above that is completely unnecessary. If you're doing things like video editing, um, something like an i7 or, uh, you know, one of the six-core i7s, like the Ivy Bridge E processors or Xeon, um, are really great. But the higher you go, you know, the more you're paying for something that you may or may not notice, depending on what you're doing. Um, it depends on how CPU heavy your tasks are, et cetera, et cetera. You know, Xeons are much more expensive, but you're going to get like an eight, eight core processor. It's probably overkill for a lot of people. But if you're doing a lot of really heavy video editing, could be worth it. Can I make a? I'm going I'm to be arrogant and assume I know what they're asking. <laughs> okay, go the, for it. I uh, when it, when we're talking about um, i7 or Xeon i7, you're going to spend too much money on a Xeon. Intel's overpriced them. I was talking to Tony Mac, the Hackintosh guy, about this, and it's just not affordable for someone to buy and build a Xeon system for the most part. It's cheaper to buy one that's made for you. So it's really 
there's really like I know no that's true with it. Macs. Is that true with PCs though? It should be. The I mean the the okay. Mac Pro is very expensive. Well, I I guess that's I guess that's yeah I guess PCs are cheaper to buy than build technically, but um yeah that's true. I, I'm using an Ivy Bridge E processor. It's got six cores. It's kind of a good. In my opinion, it's a good in-between if you actually are doing a lot of CPU-heavy tasks like video editing, but you don't want to spend a crap ton of money, but you want something more than just what a regular consumer-grade i7 will do. Ivy Bridge E isn't bad. But again, you got to think about what you're doing, and um, you know if you don't need the C- if you don't need an insane amount of CPU power, you know a regular i5 or i7 is totally fine and is overkill for the majority of people. Yeah. Um, and when your questions are that broad, it leads me to believe that. Um, you haven't done a lot of research and maybe don't really know what you're using this processor for yet. And I don't mean to assume things about these question askers, but you know, these were. It sounds like you need to do a more research. Well, what, I, I want to just add one thing here with the in terms of the best processor that's not overclocked. I don't know anything about AMD processors, so I can't speak to the broad range of of what's available. But in terms of Intel, I was actually looking at this specifically because I'm updating our Hackintosh guide today, and and seeing what you know what it, what is the most affordable but powerful build, and after going through all the all the different Intel processors that will work with Hackintoshes, um, I I was looking at you know overclock overclocking on a Hackintosh is really not very valuable, but. The uh, uh, I was looking at the processors and the core i the core, un, the non overclocked core i5 hits a very good price point sweet spot to power ratio. It's basically not that much slower than the most powerful core i7. It loses a couple of features that most people probably won't care about, but it comes in at two hundred nine dollars instead of like three hundred and sixty. <laughs> so you save a ton of money on it, and the and like the speed difference is minimal, and it's actually faster on the single core side. So yeah. um, let me just look at this because like, I brought it up. It's the i5 4670. It's 3.4 gigahertz and and it's like it's 209 bucks, uh, at least on Amazon. I'm assuming it's the same everywhere. But if we're talking about like what's the best non-overclock processor and we have nothing else to go on on that, that would be my answer. Yeah, there's a difference between number of cores and how fast the processor is on a single core. You know, for things like gaming, mm-hmm. you're better off with fewer cores and a faster processor. At, yeah, least, so, at the moment, that's changing soon, but um, you know, most games don't use more than one or two cores. Yeah, and so this is going to be probably better for most things in terms of speed, and it's not that much slower on the multi-core. Yeah. So you wouldn't be sacrificing anything noticeable. Yeah. If, but So if you're building a computer, I highly recommend going and checking out our guide to building a computer and thinking about what you're using this processor for and looking at the prices of the processors because just throwing money at processors isn't necessarily the best option. Um, in fact, it rarely is. All right, um, well, let's do one last question because um, okay. this is a good one. What Do you guys know what hardware acceleration is on browsers and why does it affect gaming on my browser? Um, so this is a pretty easy question. Hardware acceleration is in any program, not just browsers, but hardware acceleration is uh, basically your computer handing off CPU intensive tasks to your graphics card. So if you have a decent graphics card in your computer, it can kind of take some of the load off your CPU. And since graphics cards are pretty powerful, uh, can help make that gaming smoother or better. Uh, you know, video, regular video games use your graphics card for a lot, but in your browser, they don't necessarily, unless you turn on hardware acceleration. A lot of that is usually offloaded to the, or put on the CPU instead. So if you're gaming in a browser, hardware acceleration is a useful feature to have, um, provided you have, you know, a decent graphics card. I don't know how well it would work with something like integrated graphics. It's been a long time since I've used them for anything that mattered. <laughs> but yeah, hardware acceleration is pretty cool. Yeah, I have seen it cause problems sometimes, but usually you don't have to worry about that unless you, you know, have graphical issues. Turn hardware acceleration off and see if it fixes them. But that's a really, really basic kind of introduction to hardware acceleration. All right, let's move on to tips and downloads of the week. Uh, Eric, why don't you start yes. us off? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get that for a second. <laughs> no, uh, Thorne had a post saying, why saying I don't know adds credibility. And basically the idea is that, I mean, we make up stuff for answers all the time, which is 
why I'm not actually talking about the processor thing. I should know about processors, but I don't. So I'm keeping out of that topic. But when you have someone who admits that they don't necessarily know a topic, that makes them seem more, like, th like that they will be honest about the information that they don't have. Um, as opposed to someone who kind of makes up an answer as they're going, and you can tell that they're not, they don't know what they're talking about. And then not only are they not knowledgeable now, but they're a liar too. <laughs> cool. I like it. Um, yeah. I like it too because it says we're all idiots. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. <laughs> all right. My tip is about how to view and erase your Facebook search history. A lot of people don't know this, but Facebook logs everything you search for. It doesn't um, surprise me. I it didn't doesn't know actually that. surprise me at all. I just didn't really, you <laughs> know, it's surprised. one of those things that you don't know it's there until you find it, and mm -hmm. it's buried under a number of menus. Uh, but if you go to uh, your activity log, which you can get from the gear icon in Facebook, and then click the more button on the left sidebar, you will see a uh, search section of your activity log. And that is where Facebook logs everything you have ever searched for. Uh, this isn't really a huge problem unless you have people that are actively looking for this and there's something in there you don't want people to see. <laughs> <laughs> but it can be nice to, it also can be nice to see it if you, if you are like, man, I found something last week via Facebook search, but I don't remember what the name of it was. You can go back to this menu and find it in your search history. Or if you want to erase it for one reason or another, there is a clear searches button which you can click and everything will go away, at least from you know your private view. Um, I'm sure Facebook keeps those things logged for eternity on their own servers, but it won't be on your side. And it's also important to say that you're the only person that can see this. So the only reason you might need to protect this is if someone else has a password to your account and they, you know, there's something you don't want them to see, or something like that. Or they're using or you just leave your desktop logged in. Yeah. all the time. Yeah, like and you're searching for like, you know, porn stars or something on Facebook. Or okay, that's just the time. worst idea, ex, though. Ex ex girlfriends. I haven't <laughs> done that yet, but I'm going to now. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm sure they're the all best on porn Facebook. stars on Facebook for the same reason that like we're on Facebook, you know, self promotion and all that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Did you just call us porn stars? With I'm me. just saying. <laughs> um, I mean, maybe. You so know, that's they, people don't know everything about us. I'll put a link in the show notes <laughs> that <laughs> shows you how to find and erase your Facebook search history. Dachis, why don't you tell us about your tip? Okay. Um, well, actually, this tip comes from Milani, and I just thought it was so funny that I had to choose it. It's, uh, it's about putting a mirror in the kitchen so uh, you're more self-conscious about what you eat. It can help you eat more healthily. Uh, and... I I, th I thought this was really interesting because if I ever um, if I'm if I ever look at myself before I'm about to eat and I think oh, there's a little too much I I, I, I think I, I gained five pounds in my so, ear. Hold on, a little too much. What do you have pounds on you? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean there, I I've weighed more than this before. Okay. So, it's uh so there there I mean I've been I've been like moderately self conscious about my I wouldn't say weight but you know body I guess a little bit and um and so if I ever have been you know the mirror would always encourage me to be a little bit more thoughtful about what I'm eating and so I thought this was I thought it was interesting that there's actually a study about this where um where if you put a, a mirror in the kitchen or or in the dining room or wherever you're eating that you'll be uh, that you'll be more thoughtful about that because you'll be looking at yourself and you'll see yourself judging you for what you're eating. <laughs> it sounds like a horrible way to live. I, I love it self does, It does, but it. effective. Constantly seeing your, looking into your own judgy eyes <laughs> everywhere you well, go around how, your house. That's how I solved nail biting, though. I mean, I recorded myself scolding myself for nail biting, and then <laughs> I watched remember the that. video. Do you still have this video? Uh, yeah, somewhere. I did not <laughs> post it online, but I did write a post about it. So I remember that. That was awesome. It was. It's oddly effective. <laughs> so I, I do recommend it if you really, if you need, if you really want to feel bad, but actually get the job done. Have you considered offering that service, like recording scolding videos for other people? <laughs> You know what? If someone if someone wants to pay me to do that, I'm not opposed to it. Put that up on Fiverr. I'm I might yeah I yeah, might even do that Fiverr for free. Thing. It is it is that is okay. Well, I've got somewhere to be after this podcast. Just <laughs> FYI. <laughs> I'll see you guys later. Okay. All right. Let's move on to our downloads. Okay. Eric, you're first. 
Okay, so I'm specifically doing this one because I have an internal controversy over it, but Hit Bliss, a couple commenters mentioned this on the comments of the TV streaming post. Basically, Hit Bliss allows you to just sit and watch a whole bunch of ads, maybe interact with some, and in doing that, you earn credits to buy or rent movies and television shows online. So, like, during that infographic, we learned that like 90% of all the TV shows were available to buy on Amazon or to rent on Amazon, I think. But not but to you, stream. Yeah, well, I mean, well, if you well, add them to your stream, library, you can stream. Free right. with your Prime subscription. Right, exactly. You couldn't get it with Prime, but you can pay money for it. Hitbliss allows you to do that with movies, and apparently for just some customers, they're experimenting with doing that through Amazon itself. So... It's kind of like when you go to the airport and you have to watch an ad before you can access their free Wi-Fi. Exactly. Or like Although it's where you can choose to watch a two-minute ad before your show instead of having commercials interrupt you. Right. Only way longer. Like I did it this morning, and it was like 10 to 15 minutes of ads, and you have to like sit there and like every so often they'll say, are you paying attention? Hit enter and hit enter. <laughs> oh, and it's, it's that's a- interesting that they do that now because I, um, I go to the bathroom during those two-minute ads. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, for Hulu it wouldn't do that, but for this thing, like you're supposed to be for earning Hitless. money to do that, and it's a full screen Windows app. I think it's for Mac and Android too, so it's what not if like you have you multiple can... monitors. I actually don't know. I should try that eh? out. Eh? But but you still have to be well, no, because if you change focus, then it still uh, says like we're pausing the video now. So dang, yeah, this exactly. Is... It's it's super strict. It's very strict. On the other but hand, I have a laptop. Yeah. On the other hand, it took like 10 to 15 minutes to incur enough uh, credit to where I rented like a $5 movie rental. That's not bad. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty good return on investment. So, like, I kind of hate myself for doing it, mostly because I watched, like, this... There are, like, 10 ads, and I watched five of them three times. But (laughs) on the other hand, I get to go watch Simon Pegg be in a movie now for free. So... Mm. I don't know. It depends on how much self-loathing you have and and how much money you don't want to spend. Exactly. If you're like completely broke and you want to watch movies, yeah. it's not a bad way to do it. I can see them doing this once a week for a movie night. There are other yeah. limitations too. Like you can't. I can, well, the nice thing is you certain. don't have to watch them right before you watch the movie. You know, like exactly. if I'm sitting around cooking dinner or something, I can have my laptop and be like watching the commercials. Like exactly. Up my credit for after dinner movie. That's an ex- that's a very good way to do that. So yeah, cool. I like it. Hit bliss. And that is for Windows, Mac, and Android? Yes. It's not so. for iOS? That's for I, I don't know. I think they might be working on an iOS app. But... The, oh, there the, must be the only developer ever that developed for Android <laughs> before iOS. Yeah, it says coming soon there. So. Crazy. Yeah. Cool. All right. Name awesome. is Hit Bliss. My download this week is called YouTube Resize. It does exactly what it sounds like. Um, and it is for Chrome and Firefox. Although when I tried it on Firefox, it did not work correctly. But it works great on Chrome. Wait, Whitson, what's Firefox? <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, YouTube, first of all, here's a little YouTube tip baked into this because I always forget about this. But um, YouTube videos are always a little bit too small for me. I would like them to take up more of the screen without them having to be full screen. And there is that little rectangle icon in the bottom right-hand corner of the YouTube player that lets you expand it to the full width, at least, of uh, the web page, which is nice. YouTube resize kind of makes it a little bit more controlled and lets you go bigger. You basically click and drag the corner of the video, just like you would any window on a computer, to make it as big or as small as you want. It's really smooth, really responsive, at least on Chrome, and it is a great way to make your YouTube videos as big as you want. Um, without necessarily going full screen and sacrificing the rest of your monitor. So it's called YouTube Resize. It's for Chrome and sort of Firefox. And even if you don't want that particular extension, you should go to Thorin's post just to see Gandalf zooming into your face. Yes. I was wondering if you picked picked this download just for that. You know, (laughs) seeing Gandalf sax guy is really... It does have subconscious implications on my personal biases. You know, it's it's kind of like I've realized that if we put a picture of the TARDIS from Doctor Who in the mm-hmm. image of any post, people will automatically like the heck out of that post on Facebook. <laughs> like, it could be the worst it's post true. ever, and people will just be like, this is amazing, TARDIS! <laughs> like, it's, you could try that out. Yeah, so it's uh, I mean, that's just like a little 
sneaky trick I'm using to get people to like stuff. <laughs> no, it's not. But this, I'm pretty sure that's what made I me am. like. I am. I get the TARDIS at everything. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor Who hacker. Mm. Um, <laughs> So I'm yeah, a Doctor Thorne, Who fan, so Thorne has okay. a really good GIF of it in action. If you just go to the post, you can kind of see what it looks like. It's pretty cool. Anyway, YouTube resize. I guess that leaves me. It does. I don't have one download, but many, as we sometimes do. I, <laughs> I uh, was really happy to see Thorne's post this week on the Non-Jailbreaker's Guide to iOS Emulation. And if you're familiar with iOS and emulation together, you know that uh, Apple's not so fond of emulators in the App Store. Sometimes they leak in and you can grab them and that's great, but... But then they go down like 10 minutes later. Yeah, so if you don't get it, you don't get it. And then, and, the, and if you want to do some emulation, you kind of have to jailbreak and download the em emulators from Cydia. However, there's been a new method that kind of uh, opened up in the last year. Apple has an enterprise developer certificate thing that they do where... If, if a company wants to deploy an app to anybody without going to the App Store so they don't have to go through a, a, any process with Apple because it's just, you know, for their company's use, they can get the certificate and then create a manifest online and people can just click a button to download it, basically, and it installs a certificate on their phone and they can install one app from that company. So, or one app under that certificate. So what um, some tricky uh, developers have done is is create is get an enterprise certificate and do that for iOS apps. And so you can now download all these, you can basically sideload from the internet uh, a bunch of emulators. That's been the primary purpose of, of uh, <laughs> this enterprise thing for, uh, you know, for the rest of us. So it means you can get a lot of emulators on, on your iPhone if you know where to go, and this post shows you how to go there and get them. So... Uh, I highly recommend checking that out if you're not a jailbreaker, if you can't jailbreak for some reason, um, or you just don't want to. It's it's definitely worth it, so we'll have a link to that in the show notes. The a iOS. few other tips, too. Um, there, are, there are a few emulators like Game Boy and NES that you can actually play in oh, a web app. Oh, and the web browser, yeah, I forgot about cool. that. And um, he also gives a few good sources, like Touch Arcade, um, to follow, so you can keep up with when some of these emulators leak onto the App Store and grab them as soon as they leak. Because once you grab it, you have it for life, as long as you keep it back up in iTunes, even if they pull it from the App Store. So that's, you know, if you can follow that and get the emulators you want, it's for life. less of a hassle. Yes, for life. All right, that is it for us today. Uh, thanks for watching the show, guys. Please uh, leave us a rating or review on iTunes if you like the show. That's awesome. That helps us out a ton. If you want to keep up with any of these tips and downloads and stories as they happen throughout the week, um, you know, our podcast is just a tiny weekly thing we do. We're running a big site that posts a ton of stuff every day. You can follow the site on Twitter at Lifehacker, on Facebook.com at, uh, sorry, on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Lifehacker, and on Google Plus at Google.com slash Plus Lifehacker. You can also follow all of us individually on Twitter and Facebook and whatnot. You can find our individual accounts at Lifehacker.com slash About. You can also follow our sub-blogs, which now include Hackerspace at Hackerspace.Lifehacker.com, After Hours at AfterHours.Lifehacker.com, uh, which is our life hacking, the not safe for work side of life, and Two Cents, our personal finance sub-blog that launched this week at twocents.lifehacker.com. You can find the show notes for this episode in the description of this podcast. You can find the show notes for this and every other episode of the show going back to the beginning of time at lifehacker.com slash the show. The show notes usually go up on Thursdays at 1 p.m. Pacific time. The show airs live on YouTube at around 10 a.m. Pacific time, though it varies depending on how late we are being at stuff. That's it for us. <laughs> Thanks for listening, guys. We will see you next week. Bye. Bye.